Good afternoon and welcome to the annual town meeting of May 22nd, 2021. It being 1.04 p.m. and a quorum present, I will call this meeting to order. Return of the warrant shows that it has been properly served. Uh, at some point in the near future, I will get the total number of registered voters, but they're still coming in. Please stand as you are able and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing thereafter for a moment of silence for those we have lost since our last town meeting, particularly Martha Boisvert and Janine Giles, and for all, including ourselves, who have struggled through this pandemic. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Be seated. I would now like to introduce the people at the head tables. On my left is the select board and the town administrator. In the back row, John Washkevitz, Amy Carson, Jay Nevin Smith, Joyce Junglo, Chairman David Phil, Town Administrator Carolyn Brennan. On this side, we have the Finance Committee, the Town Clerk, and Town Council. Paul Benjamin of the Finance Committee, Amy Feiden, Chair, Valerie Hood, Alexi Levine, Dylan Manns, Town Council, Jeff Blake, and Town Clerk, Jessica Spanknable. I am your moderator, Randy Iser. Uh, I'd like to thank Hadley Media, as usual, for setting up the sound system and recording and streaming the meeting. With us today, we have our state rep, Dan Carey, somewhere, right there. Uh, at this time, the select board would like to make two dedications. One is the town report, and that'll be done by uh, David Phil. All right, so the first dedication is of the annual report for 2020 is to David Nixon, our retired town administrator. And David's uh, tenure spanned 15 years, a remarkable feat for any town administrator. And uh, David is sitting right over there. And during that time, he worked for 17 different select board members, all with very different personalities and he lived to tell the tale afterwards. Uh, he saw Hadley's bond rating rise from A plus to triple A, a rating that's enjoyed by only a handful of uh, communities in the Commonwealth. Uh, during his tenure, he also completed uh, three significant building projects, Senior Center, Library, and North Hadley Fire Station. And um, uh, David was instrumental in advocating for the change of elected treasurer and collector positions to be appointed and uh, all done in, David's vision had a, a, a theme of continuous improvement for the town of Hadley. Um, let's see. I'm trying to give you the Cliff Notes version here but due to uh, the heat. And so uh, David's widely known through the Commonwealth uh, as an expert on all things small town. And he's provided mentorship to many aspiring public servants. And David Nixon has embraced Hadley's strengths, acknowledges its, its uh, weaknesses, and left our town in better position than when he, he arrived. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you, David, and congratulations on your retirement. And our next dedication is to Martha Boisvert. Uh, Martha Pipchinski Boisvert was the sixth of ten children born to Adolph and Mary uh, Konsik Pipchinski at home at their home in Stockwell Road in North Hadley. As a rooted farmer's daughter, she would not only exemplify the spirit of hard work, but become one of the most humble, generous, and committed citizens in her hometown of North Hadley. In the years following high school and college graduation, 
Martha experienced many professional achievements from social work to insurance to nonprofit and educational foundation work. She co-founded North Hadley Sugar Shack and the Boysvert Family Farm along with her two sons, uh, which was built on their parents' farmland where she grew up and played on as a kid. There, along with her daughter, Jenny, uh, Martha not only baked, but helped teach and educate local school children and visiting families uh, of the process of making maple syrup and maple candy. Her bakery workroom became Bachi's kitchen. In her later years, Martha began teaching her granddaughters her techniques so they could carry on that legacy, and they continue to do so. She was a devoted mother, grandmother, and, si and sibling, as well as a committed yet reserved community leader. She knew how to apply the art of persuasion, education, and respectfulness to accomplish her dreams, achieve her goals, and improve the well-being of, of her fellow citizens, neighbors, friends, and family. Martha's humble legacy of community service and gentle influence was her, in her favorite town is being carried on by all three of her children who reside in Hadley with their own families to this day. One works for the DPW, one works at the school, and one serves on the Hadley Fire Department. Martha fully gave of herself for her family, for her community, and for a better world, and for all of which we remain grateful and honored to have had her in our lives. Okay, and now Joyce Chungla will dedicate the Oakley Award. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is unusual. This is the first time that we've had some young people that are going to actually receive the Fred Oakley uh, Award recipients, and they are brother and sister. So is Gage and Sloan here? Where are they? Oh, hi. Nice to have you come and be here. Appreciate all that you've done for the town for the last year and even more. Gage and Sloan spank and Abel. If something's happening in the town of Hadley, we are used to seeing some familiar young faces of late. Gage and Sloan Spank and Abel have gone above and beyond in support of community spirit, especially in this past year. The siblings are the children of Michael Spank and Abel, who is the town's fire chief, and Jessica Spank and Abel, who serves as our town clerk. Gage graduated from Hopkins Academy in 2019 and currently attends UMass Amherst. In 2018, with the help with his father, Gage researched and created a junior firefighter program at Hopkins Academy. He and his friend Liam Higgins were the first two students to pilot this program. Gage also invested many volunteer hours at the public safety complex, from mowing the lawn to assembling emergency bags for every classroom at Hopkins Academy, Hadley Elementary School, and the Chinese Immersion School. These bags were packed with important basic supplies, first aid kits, anything appropriate for the particular age group of the event of a lockdown. Gage has been serving on Hadley's Volunteer Fire Department since 2018 as a junior firefighter. He also helped the school committee with a presentation to the Hadley Community Preservation Act Committee, representing the students' point of view on the Hopkins Field Project. Hadley Park and Recreation has relied on Gage several times as a referee for basketball and soccer. Sloan attends Pioneer Valley Immersion Charter School in Hadley, where she's a member of the class of 2022. On Easter this past year, Sloan was our bunny, spending over five hours visiting all the residents of Hadley. During Christmas, she was an elf riding in the fire truck with Mr. and Mrs. Claus. These events cheered people up during a time when people were stuck in their houses and could not see family and friends due to the pandemic. Both Gage and Sloan supported the fire department in shopping and delivering efforts for people encouraged to stay at home. It became commonplace to see Sloan in the grocery store pushing our senior citizens who were at risk. Pushing? Oh, wait, ma'am. Go. <laughs> that away, Sloan. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I got trifocals on here. Hang on. Um, let's see. There's one of the seniors right here. Wait a minute. Uh, it became commonplace to see Sloan in the grocery store pushing shopping cart and checking items off a list on behalf of the fire department and senior center for our senior centers who were at risk. At our outdoor town meeting last year, Gage and Sloan were there helping when they, wherever they were needed. They also volunteered with American Legion and senior center annual dinner events. 
These young people have made a lasting impact, especially during COVID this past year in the town of Hadley. They kept spirits up with the kids during the holidays, shopped for our seniors who couldn't leave their homes during the pandemic, and lastly, helped our town prepare and get through spring and fall town meetings. Most importantly, Gage and Sloan always serve their community with a smile, showing that they are truly glad to be helping their friends and families. So thank you very much. We appreciate all your hard work. Um, I have a public service announcement. Last Saturday, the Hadley Climate Change Committee put together a Hadley cleanup day, which involved about 40 people walking some of the streets in town and picking up trash. I don't have a tally of the total trash picked up, but I know that my wife and I did it for three hours and we filled two 50-gallon trash bags. Uh, this is intended to be an annual event, so please volunteer next year. And we have 133 voters here today. That being said, we can start the fun stuff. Okay, we're going to start the meeting as usual with the consent agenda, and I will explain what that is. Warrant articles on a consent agenda are exceptions to the general process of town meeting. The select board, moderator, and finance committee identify for town meeting consideration those articles that they believe should generate no controversy and can be properly voted without debate. And you know what? I forgot something. Back up. We need rules before we can start this. I apologize. Okay, meeting rules. Meeting will be conducted according to town meeting time. If you wish to speak to an article, there's one microphone out in the, in the field today. So just stand behind it as if we were inside and wait your turn to be recognized by the moderator. Someone will come and sanitize the microphone after every use just to be safe. State your name and residential address each time you have been recognized to speak. Keep all comments relative to the article or motion at hand. Do not disrespect any person in any way, shape, or form. Do not refer to any previous speaker by name. Please use previous speaker instead. You may speak as many times as you feel is necessary, but please give others a chance to speak before returning to the microphone. If necessary, I will ask you to wait until others have had a chance to speak. Direct your comments to me, the moderator. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Any amendments must be submitted in writing to me as soon as the amendment is offered. And please silence all your electronic devices. Now we will begin with the consent agenda. And I will not reread what I already have. At the call of the consent agenda, the moderator will read out the numbers of the articles one by one. If one or more voters object to any particular article being included in the consent agenda, they shall yell hold in a loud voice when the number is called. The article will be removed automatically from the consent agenda and restored to its original place in the warrant to be debated and voted under the usual manner. After the calling of the individual items in the consent agenda, the moderator will ask for a motion that the voters pass all items remaining as a unit on one vote. Use of the consent agenda makes the process of town meeting more efficient by speeding up the handling of non-controversial items. The consent agenda also includes the procedural motion to allow department heads and agents of the town to address town meeting from time to time for information. Okay. All articles in the consent agenda have been recommended unanimously by all relevant boards and committees. The motion for the consent agenda is this. Move that the town take articles 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 19, and 27 out of order and that they may be passed by consent in accordance with the motion shown on the consent agenda distributed this morning and further allow all officers, department heads, and agents of the town to address the town meeting on matters as may be informational. After I get a motion and a second, Carolyn, the town administrator, will give a quick overview of what these articles are. If anybody has any questions, then can deal with them. So do I have a motion? motion? Got a motion. And a second. All those in favor? Raise your cards please. Make sure you raise your cards and not your hands. I need to know that you have a card. Thank you. Any opposed? Motion 
passes unanimously. Carolyn, please. How's that? Okay, real quick. Article 6, grants and gifts. This allows the town to accept grants and gifts throughout the fiscal year so that a town meeting does not need to be called when we receive grants and gifts. This is purely administrative. Article 7 is Chapter 90. This is the Chapter 90 program. Presently, we receive about $365,000 from the state each year to help maintain our roads and bridges. This gives the town authority to spend this money. Article 8, short-term borrowing. This gives the treasurer the authority to borrow within the fiscal year in, an in anticipation of funds if we do not have the cash available. We haven't had to do this, but it's a good safeguard in case we ever need to. Number nine, fund balance transfer. David Nixon, I think lovingly labeled this the sweep article, and this basically is cleaning up from a project that is completed or the money is no longer needed. The remaining balance is transferred back to its original source, and this gives us the opportunity to reduce borrowing authority authorization. Number 10, the water treatment plant filtration membrane. Every year at town meeting, the town transfers $26,000 from the water reserve fund to pay the 10-year down payment on the water filtration units over at the water treatment plant. This ensures that monies are available to replace the filters when needed Number 11 is uh, CPA, it's administrative. This includes the $3,000 administrative costs for CPA and the set aside of 10% of CPA funds for three purposes that are required by law. S Article 19, CPA extensions. These projects need more time to complete and this extends the sunset provisions on those projects. Article 27, moderator term. The present term for moderator is one year and this would be extending the term to three years. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions on any of this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, now we'll jump right into the regular articles. Article one is a COVID rental assistance article. And your paperwork shows uh, $100,000 and I'm going to make a friendly amendment via the CPA committee. Uh, they had information come in after the warrant closed that indicated to them that $100,000 was not necessary. So it's gonna get dropped down to 25,000. So the article, the motion will read, Move that the town appropriate and transfer $25,000 from the Community Preservation Act Housing Fund to be granted to the Hadley Housing and Economic Development Committee for the purpose of supporting community houses, housing through an emergency rental assistance COVID-19 program and to authorize the select board to enter into a grant agreement setting forth the terms of said grant with the added conditions that one, no funds will be dispersed prior to the signing by both parties of a letter of agreement between the select board and the qualifying organization administrating the program on behalf of the Hadley Housing and Economic Development Committee addressing eligibility, administration, and oversight, and two, if the funds are not expended under the Emergency Rental Assistance Program by Special Town Meeting 2022, any unused balances shall be returned to the Community Preservation Housing Fund. The select board, finance committee, recommend this 500 community preservation act committee recommends 601 do i have a motion and i have a motion and a second who will speak to this dylan mans from the finance committee who is also on the housing and economic development committee is that correct
Testing. There we go. All right. Uh, my name is Dylan Manns. I'm representing the uh, Hadley Housing and Economic Development Committee. Uh, the Hadley Emergency Rental Assistance Program uh, we're putting in place, this project is intended to provide temporary relief to Hadley residents, uh, people that have experienced a negative economic impact as a direct result of COVID-19, you know, are unable to meet the rent obligations. Uh, in order to qualify for the program, uh, there are several criteria that will need to be met, uh, including residency of the town of Hadley. Uh, income, they will need to prove that they have 100% uh, or less of the area median income. Hardship proof, uh, which means loss of income or increase in expenses due to COVID, uh, as well as need. Uh, we, uh, the Hadley Housing Economic Development Committee, are uh, in favor of the friendly amendment to drop it to $25,000, uh, and the funds will be returned by fall of 2022 if the funds aren't dispersed. Thank you. Thank you. Dylan? Anybody have any questions on this? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Andy Morris, Reben, 45 Roosevelt Street, uh, Hadley. First, I want to thank the select board for having town meeting on my 60th birthday. Happy birthday. Happy thank birthday. you, thank you. Well, with, here with all my friends. Um, this is the second phase of this program. There were originally $50,000 available uh, that are being returned to the select board. Is it that no one has applied for this, or did no one meet the criteria? There is no successful applicants uh, to the program. No one qualified. We had a 10-week runtime. Uh, the committee started this process last June uh, in response to uh, Baker, Governor Baker's uh, shutdown in March. Uh, it was supposed to be on the special town meeting. Uh, it got pushed. Uh, and by the time contracts were signed, it started the beginning of March. Uh, and so we've had 10, 10 weeks, zero successful applicants. Uh, part of that reason, uh, CAPV is the, uh, admi the administer of the fund. Uh, they said that there were tax returns during that time as well as additional stimulus money uh, that supported people. Uh, the reason that we felt it was necessary to continue the program for at least another 20 or so weeks until special town, uh, fall town meeting uh, was because the eviction moratorium got moved from December 31st of last year to June 30th of this year. So we're coming upon a, a phase where people might uh, need an additional assistance in order to get through. Uh, especially as we begin to op reopen here in Massachusetts. Would you uh, encourage anyone who might need rental assistance to apply for this money? Uh, yes, we encourage you to apply. Um, CAPV is the administer, uh, and there will be a, a phone number to call them, uh, and they can also help with other programs if you don't qualify for this. They are, they've been in the community for 35 years uh, and helping people find uh, assistance through all sorts of different issues uh, in that time. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Jonah Berger, 21 Norwalk Drive. Um, I have a question about the funding for this. So we just passed by consent Article 11 for 45,000 from for housing. Yeah. 45000 as part of Article 11 for housing from CPA. Is this part of that funds, or is this an additional $25,000? Uh, this is a separate fund specific to uh, people that need rental assistance due to COVID uh, hardship. So it's separate from that. Okay. And were there any other funding sources that were sought, or was it just CPA was the first choice, and so we're using CPA? So CPA has a component that is a for, uh, for housing in the community. Uh, it felt like the most appropriate bucket to use from. Uh, the original 50000 that was used uh, from uh, December through the end of May uh, was from the Hadley Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And that money is depleted? That money is being returned to that fund. It was a stopgap measure to reach us to town meeting today so we could vote on it. Thank you. Richard Wilga, 28 Chamura Road. I attended a meeting here several years ago that created this Community Preservation Act, and we were told at that time there were only three instances where this money could be spent. Historic preservation, open space, and recreation.
apparently since then, the Commonwealth in their infinite wisdom added two more that could be spent. Assistance on private housing and even putting back into the general fund of the town. Now, I think that this proposal is out of line with what we were initially, I voted for it because of, it was obvious that getting a match of 100% funding from the Commonwealth, it was a no-brainer. But now that match is down to almost half of that. And, uh, and this is something that I do not, I can't see it. CPA money should be not be used to, to be a part of the welfare state. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and in response to that, I appreciate that and hear the concern. Um, under the state of emergency, Char uh, Governor Baker put us under. Uh, they did approve the CPA funds to be used for programs like this. Uh, we aren't the only community that's proposing uh, a rental relief program. Uh, at the last I checked, there was about 60% of towns in Massachusetts that were doing this program. Uh, most of them were using CPA funds. Um, and we do agree that we don't want the uh, funds to be abused in any way. That's why we have an administrator uh, that will go through those four criteria in order to qualify people that are actual in need. And any funds that don't get used in the next 20 or so weeks until a fall town meeting, uh, we'll, we will return that back to the CPA for future projects. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Dwyer. I built a wire 388 River Drive. Uh, just a point of clarification. Um, the motion reads to special town meeting 2022. So that's a year and 27 weeks. Which is what you're correct. You're correct. It is 2022. Um, time has moved both fast and slow in the last 15 months. My apologies. Okay, any other questions? Hearing none, uh, this take the majority vote. All those in favor signify by raising your cards. Thank you. Any opposed, raise your cards. Okay, motion passes 128 to 5. Article 2 is a CPA article relative to North Hadley Cemetery, Russellville Cemetery, and Hockenham Cemetery. Select Board, Finance Committee, and Community Preservation Act Committee all recommend this unanimously. Move that the town appropriate and transfer $60,000 from Community Preservation Act General Fund to the Hadley Cemetery Committee for the preservation and restoration of historic gravestones at North Hadley Cemetery, and further appropriate and transfer $23,052.15 from Community Preservation Act Historic Set-Aside Fund, and transfer $6,947.85 from Community Preservation General Fund to the Hadley Cemetery Committee for the preservation and restoration of historic gravestones at Russellville Cemetery, and further appropriate and transfer $65,000 from Community Preservation Act General Fund to the Hadley Cemetery Committee for replacement of the stone fence at the historic Hockenham Cemetery and to authorize the select board to enter into any grant agreement or agreements as necessary with the condition that if the funds are not expended by special town meeting 2022, any unused balances shall be returned to the Community Preservation General Fund. Do I have a motion? Second. I have a motion and a second. Who will speak to this? Mr. Weinberg. Good afternoon. My name is Alan Weinberg, 108 Bay Road. I'm the chairman of the cemetery committee. And the committee is requesting town meeting approval of Community Preservation Act funds for restoration of 94 gravestones at the North Hadley Cemetery and 42 gravestones at the Russellville Cemetery. These include gravestones which, have, which are fallen, broken, or severe, severely leaning. CPA in the town meeting has previously funded gravestone work at Old Hadley, Hockenham, and Plainville cemeteries. This is part of a multi-year program to get the cemeteries uh, in good shape. In addition, the, the committee is proposing to remove the deteriorated stone wall at the Hockenham Cemetery and to replace the wall with a granite post and steel chain fence. 
the Hadley Historical Commission and the Hakanam Village Association have endorsed these projects. Thank you. Anybody have any questions or concerns about this? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by raising your cards. Oh, this requires a majority as well. Okay, thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, Article 3, Planning Board motion. And this article is uh, definitions on zoning. And the, the motion reads, move that the town amend the zoning bylaws as delineated in Article 3 of the warrant of the annual town meeting held on May 22nd, 2021, and incorporated by reference herein, and that the town clerk may make formatting and numbering changes as necessary to preserve consistency of the zoning bylaws. Do I have a motion? Second. Okay. Speak to this. Failed it twice. Three times you're out. Yes, there, there you go. go. Down. No, up. <laughs> Wise guy. The planning board recommends unanimously acceptance of this article. What it does, it takes the definitions that are in various sections of the zoning bylaw right now and combines them into a new subsection 1.2. And it also defines some terms that are used in the bylaw that are possibly different than what the state building code uses, and, but it defines areas of the bylaw that are, defines words in the bylaw that are not defined presently, and it makes clear, for, especially for the building inspector and anybody using the bylaw, what some of the confusing terms mean by simply stating what they mean. Is that it? Okay. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Go ahead. Andy Morris, Ripon, 45 Roosevelt Street. Is it possible to waive the reading of this amendment? Oh, you did? Yes, please. Where was I, asleep? Okay. So, would, Andy, was your question to waive the reading of the whole thing? So did you make a motion for that? He did. Well, he did real. Uh, well, I don't need to make a motion if we already decided to waive it, right? Typically we do, so if everybody's okay with it, then we're okay. With Please, it. let's go on. Okay, thank you. So let's move on. Okay, so we're good. We're good. Did somebody make a motion to move the article? Not yet. Oh, yeah, uh, they, they did. We, we, we moved it and seconded it. Okay, so just want to make open, sure. We're open for discussion. All so right. does anybody have any questions regarding this article? And if anybody behind me does, please yell because these flags are giving me a wonderful time. Okay, we have, yes. David Ryman, 310 River Drive. Um, Speak up, please. 310 River Drive. Um, would the select board, would it be fair to say that it's not changing the enforcement of zoning, it's just codifying definitions, or would this have an effect on the way that building inspectors would you know, enforce the building code and zoning code in Hadley? It should have zero effect on enforcement, except to make it clearer what has to be enforced or how to enforce it. Anybody else have any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, this requires two-thirds. Thank you. Any opposed? Please raise your card. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Article 4. This is a planning board article as well, and it will require a two-thirds majority as well. 
Move that the town amend the zoning bylaws as delineated in Article 4 of the warrant of the annual town meeting held on May 22, 2021, and incorporated by reference herein, and that the town clerk may make formatting and numbering changes as necessary to preserve consistency of the zoning bylaws. I need a motion and a second. Second. A motion and a second. Okay. Do, do, you, do you need? You don't need a motion to waive the reading, right? We, I don't think we've done that. Okay, fine. This particular article amends the affordable housing trust fund that we adopted at the last annual town meeting. The Once a subdivision or senior housing gets more than six units, they need to comply with the affordable housing trust fund, which is 15% of the units need to be made of, used to be, need to be complied with the state, by state law on affordable housing. Currently, they have two choices. They can either put those units on their property or someplace else in town where they may own property or rent something. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund was adopted a year ago with the idea that money could be set aside in addition to those two. But the, the bylaw wasn't changed at that time because the wording was confusing. This wording now states that there will be a fund available and the developers will have three choices. They could still put it on site, they could put it off site, or they could donate a sum of money to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund trustees would then utilize that money over once the right project comes along to basically help or build affordable housing for the town of Hadley. Jimmy, uh, point of order, did you happen to mention the planning board's recommendation on this? Oh, I'm sorry. Planning board recommends this 5 to 0. Unanimous recommendation. Okay. Anybody have any questions on this? Shell. Shell Horowitz, 16 Barstow Lane. Closer. Okay. Uh, I am just wondering if there begins to be situations where there's a pile of money going uh, but no actual units of affordable housing and if perhaps that goes so far that we are out of compliance with chapter 40b what kinds of effects we might have with development showing up in places we don't necessarily want it and also i thought part of the, the thinking in this is that it's good for people of different income strata to be neighbors so uh jim or other members of the planning board perhaps you can shed some light on that presently Presently, Hadley has exceeds the 10% for 40B um, housing. I think we've got like 13 or 14%. So, however, over the next, I believe, about 10 years, some of those units will be come out, coming off, off of the affordable housing list, and we could fall below the 10%. The whole idea of the affordable housing bylaw and this trust fund is to try to keep Hadley above the 10% limit. Right now, we're in good shape, um, but it could go down, and we're trying to, just like I said, we're trying to keep it above, the, the goal is to keep it above the 10%. Mr. Dwyer. Uh, Bill Dwyer, uh, clerk of the planning board. <coughs> this, uh, the underlying inclusionary zoning bylaw was adopted in fall town meeting in 2006. Uh, since then, we've only had two projects that have triggered the inclusionary zoning. So it's uh, this is an option, uh, but uh, it, it's not something we're going to see a lot of. We have gone 14, 14 years with only two projects. Thank you. Mr. Dukevitz. Dan Dukevitz, 130 Hocknam Road. I've got a question for the planning board. Is this an advantage for developers, or is this an advantage for the residents of Hadley if this goes through? Thank you. This particular bylaw that's right in front of us is an advantage for both. Um, depending on your point of view, obviously, it could be an advantage for the developer, it could be for Hadley. But this way, if Hadley is controlling some of the money, they may be able to use it to encourage some development and make it affordable as time comes on. Right now, it's a, it's a toss-up. It's, it's, it's good for both of us, in my opinion. Thank you. 
Michelle. Michelle Morris Friedman, 45 Roosevelt Street. I have a concern about money going into a pot and maybe not being acted on for years. With the rapid rise of building costs, we might get a lot less for that money now in terms of affordable housing than we could get what well, than we could get now. And in the future, you know, maybe hundred thousand will buy half a bathroom someplace. Um, also, I just want to point out that we're making an effort in Hadley to be inclusive. And um, one other point, there's a national housing shortage, not of high-end housing, but of moderate and low-income housing. Thank you. Anybody else? OK. Uh, as I said, this requires two-thirds majority. All those in favor, signify by raising your cards. Thank you. All those opposed? Motion passes 123 to 10. Okay. Article 5 is the Building Code Stretch Energy Code. The Select Board and the Finance Committee both recommend this unanimously. Move that the town vote to amend the Town of Hadley General Bylaws by enacting Chapter 220 entitled Stretch Energy Code as delineated in Article 5 of the Warrant of the Annual Town Meeting held on May 22, 2021 and incorporated by reference herein for the purpose of regulating the design and construction of buildings for the effective use of energy pursuant to Appendix 115.AA of the Massachusetts Building Code 780 CMR, the Stretch Energy Code, including future additions, amendments, or modifications thereto with an effective date of July 1, 2021, and that the town clerk may make formatting and numbering changes as necessary to preserve consistency of the general bylaws. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion and a second. Who's, who will speak to this? Mr. Quinlan? Okay. Please come in, yes. What's his name? Mark one. Okay, great, thanks. Mark Rubitsky will speak for the town on behalf of the town for this. Hi, I'm Mark Rabinsky. I'm with the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the Department of Energy Resources. I'm the Western Coordinator for the Green Communities Program. As some of you may know, um, Hadley is interested in becoming a green community. And as part of that effort, the, a little background on green communities, where we provide grants, technical assistance, and local support to help municipalities reduce energy use and costs by implementing clean energy and energy efficiency projects in municipal buildings, facilities, and schools. To qualify as a green community in the state, uh, town or city needs to meet five criteria as laid out in the Green Communities Act. If Hadley were to achieve all five criteria, it would be awarded an initial designation of 130,000 to be used on energy conservation measures. And once it has completed that grant, it would be eligible to apply for competitive grants up to 200,000 for energy efficiency projects. Presently, 80% of communities in Massachusetts are green communities. So there's 280 of the 351 communities are green communities. Um, and I mentioned the five criteria. One of these five criteria is what you have in front of you today, and that's the, the stretch energy building code, or the, the energy code. Um, so presently in Massachusetts, um, you're given two options for building code. You have a base energy code and an optional stretch energy code that you can build to. The stretch energy code was developed in response to a call for a call for improved building efficiency. And to meet criteria five of the green communities designation, a community must adopt a stretch energy code um, and it can be adopted through the governing body of that municipality. In this case, in Hadley's case, it would be through town meeting. Um, of the, there are 291 communities that have adopted the stretch energy code. Um, of those, um, uh, Hadley's, uh, of those, none of them have rescinded it. Uh, it it's also worth noting that if the town didn't like it, it could rescind the stretch energy code also through town meeting. 
um, though none have rescinded it. Uh, Hadley is the only community left in Hampshire County to um, left to adopt the stretch energy code. And it's also worth noting that the stretch energy code only applies to new residential construction and new commercial buildings over 100,000 square feet. Um, all additions, renovations, repairs are explicitly exempt from the stretch code. So it only applies to new residential construction. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Shell. Shell Horowitz, 16 Barstow Lane. I strongly support this. Uh, you may have heard the slogan, think globally, act locally. This is an example of that. Um, if every community in the United States had adopted a code like this in, say, 1980, we would be a lot farther on the road toward our carbon goals um, under the, um, the Paris Agreement. We would be a lot farther on the road in terms of fewer asthma and other health issues around the country. We would have many, many benefits to the environment, to the economy, to our health, and to the long-term future of our planet. So please vote yes. Thank you. Andy? Andy Morris, Friedman, 45 Roosevelt Street. So if I understand this, there's five hoops we have to jump through before we get the money. And this is one of them. Um, how many more do we have to go? Um, so I've already been working with the, the planning board on um, criterias one and two. And I believe that the, the town will already meet those, and those have to do with, with zoning and permitting. Um, and the town's current, under the current rule, if I've already sent it for, in for pre preliminary review, and I believe the town already meets those, um, this is criteria five, and then there's criteria three and four left. Criteria three is to de develop a, a baseline of how much energy the town uses, and then create a plan to reduce that, that baseline use by 20% over the next five years. And criteria four is a fuel efficient vehicle policy, which I've, I've presented to the uh, select board in the past and um, they have yet to adopt it, but that would be one of the next steps after, hopefully after stretch code is, is adopted. So this will be the first out of five? Uh, officially. Okay. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. George? George Moyarty, 22 Trimmer Road. Uh, quick question. And I'm not sure you can answer that, but on an average house, uh, even you know a smaller house, what would be the uh, cost difference, or from from the code we're on now to the stretch code? Um, is it 10% more, 20% more? We've done a lot of studies on this through, through the department. In general, like really general, because you know houses are all different. Oh, um, we're looking at about one to two percent more. Um, often it's. You, you can recoup that through rebates right now, through mass save rebates. And then through our studies, we've shown that almost after within the first one to two years, there's a positive payback on the, the increase in, in, in costs. So you're, you're receiving a, a positive payback um, from that one to 2%. Because the, the really the goal of this is to minimize the life cycle cost of the, of the construction. So you're, if you can minimize how much energy you're going to reduce, you're generally getting a positive return on that investment in one to two years, which is good. So if a house in Hadley's 400000 which there's few now that you're going to build, you're talking an extra 8000 maybe or six to 8000 depending on uh, 2%, 3%. Yeah, one, 1 to 2%. Right. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Michelle. Michelle Horowitz, 16 Barstow Lane. If I could just perhaps clarify for the last speaker, the way you get that positive payback is by paying considerably less in your energy costs over the life of the house. Thank you. Anybody else? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by raising your cards. Thank you. Any opposed? Majority vote and it passes. Next item is Article 12, Revolving Funds. Finance Committee and Select Board both recommend this 500. Move that the town enact Section 86-9 of Chapter 86 of the Code of Hadley to amend existing revolving funds as printed in the warrant as delineated in Article 12 the annual town meeting warrant for May 22nd, 2019.
2021 and incorporated by reference herein. Do I have a motion? Got a motion and a second. Who will speak to this? Mr. Washkevitz, your name is on the, the list. So this is a housekeeping article. Uh, the revolving funds are, you want me to read through them all or is everybody comfortable with it? <coughs> So we move that. So the, the existing revolving fund accounts are restated without change in order to comply with municipal finance laws. There are no changes to amount, amounts, purposes, or other features to this existing revolving fund. Except for the town eliminating the electrical fund, the Russell School Fund, and the after school program fund. Anybody have any questions on this? Hearing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Article 13 is some DPW projects, uh, Finance Committee, Select Board, and Capital Planning Committee all recommend this unanimously. Move that the town vote to raise and appropriate, authorize the treasurer to borrow, transfer from water reserves, transfer from sewer reserves, transfer from sewer impact fees, transfer from funds available or otherwise provide $160,000 for expenses associated with the following projects. Mount Warner tree removal for access to the water tanks, Mount Holyoke electrical alarm system, and Knightley Road culvert head wall repair. Do I have a motion? I have a motion and a second. Mr. Okafor, I think, will speak to this. My name is Chris Oka for DPW Director. We have uh, three projects that I'm about to speak upon. One is the Mawana water storage tank. We have uh, issues in the sense that we are not able to assess the, ta the tank even in the course of emergency because of an easement. Chris, hang on a minute. Town Council says that I failed to read part of this that I don't have paperwork so I may have to read the motion again please okay I'm going to read article 13 motion again sorry for the confusion move that the town vote to appropriate $160,000 for expenses associated with the following projects Mount Warner tree removal for access to water tank Mount Holyoke electrical alarm system and nightly road culvert head wall repair and to fund said appropriation transfer $120,000 from water reserves and borrow $40,000 and further the town treasurer with the approval of the selectmen is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to Mass General Laws chapter 44 section 7 8 or other or pursuant to any other enabling authority and to issue bonds or notes of the town therefore any premium received upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote lest any such premium applied to the payment of the cost of issuance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with mass general law chapter 44 section 20 thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount do i have a motion i have a motion and a second now mr okafor please Thank you. Um, the first one is the Mawana tree removal. We are requesting the amount to be able to take out about 17 trees on our easement 
to the tank. We have a million gallon tank on Mawana and we are not able to access it in the event of an emergency because of these trees. Also, the DEP has also uh, looked at it at the time they came in last year to talk to us. We had the, they required us to fence the tank, which we've done, but the trees need to be removed. And so that's why we're asking for the $20,000 to take out the trees. We have an area about 20 foot easement that we are working on. Uh, the DPW is able to take out some of the small trees, but we have a couple of big trees that we need to remove. The issue of Mount Holyoke is also a similar issue. We have another one million gallon storage, water storage tank on Mount Holyoke, uh, but we have electrical failure. At this point, we're not able to communicate with the tank because of uh, electrical failure. So we are requesting to update the electrical lines. Uh, one of the reasons why it failed has been that uh, over 80 years, and at that time, wires are usually just put on the ground and covered with soil. So with years of and elements and chemical reactions, the, the line from Lawrence Plain to where we have the tank has failed. So that's why we are currently requesting so that it's, an, it's basically an emergency. We don't want a tank full of water where we cannot quickly communicate with the tank or if the tank has issues, we're not able to get to us on time. So again, that is where we have the 100,000 we are requesting. It has to do with electrical. It has to do with trenching. It also, we also have an easement. We're going through um, two, uh, two homeowners lots and uh, we, the plan is to fix those lots. One is a driveway, one is a dirt road. Uh, the driveway, we will be doing asphalt work on that driveway as soon as we're done with the trenching. So the last one is Knightley Road. Knightley Road, we have a covert, and, uh, but the head wall is damaged and it's been exposed for almost a year. Uh, at the time it happened, we began talking with conservation. And uh, finally, they've given us conditions and approval to fix it. And so w the, with time, it has also, da the damage has gotten worse. Uh, the, if you, are, if you, you have seen that, if you, are, if you drive through the area, you see what I'm talking about. You also look at our drawings. We, we have some poster board here to, in case you're interested to take a look. So it's also another emergency repair because of the traffic on Knightley Road. Thank you for listening to me. Does anybody have any questions on this article? Go ahead. Um, Nina Pollard, 10 Crestview. Um, I, I'm okay with most of these things. Last year at the town meeting, I believe we had $60,000 going towards the trees on Mount, Warner's, Mount Warner. I opposed it then. There, what trees? are you speaking of? I've taken photographs. There are no trees around the well. There's no trees blocking the path up the road. There's nothing. So what is it they want? It's $20,000, which isn't a great deal, but what is it for? Chris, let me answer this because I know, I know Nina and I, I know she walks the area. I walk the area, so I can probably explain it to her better than you. Nothing, nothing personal. So Nina, yes. when you're walking up Mount Warner Road, there is a new, uh, around the sharp bend, the new house that was built at the corner. At the corner now. Nod your head your, if you're following me. So the oh, new, but, new house that was built. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the old house that was torn down and rebuilt. Yeah. Just past that, there is a bunch of stuff in the road. There's blue painted pipes and things of that nature. Okay. Uh, on the side road. It's not in the road. I'm sorry. I thought it was on the trail on the way up to Mount. No, it's not on the trail. It's from... Basically, this person's property line, 20 feet wide from the road up to the tanks. And, and you'll see there are two pins marked there with yeah, orange caps on them, which I did not do. Somebody else did, so <laughs> I'm uh, free of that. Uh, anyhow, that's where it is. They're just trying, what they're trying to do is clear the easement so they can have access to the tanks okay. if they need it. Edwin. Uh, Hi, Edwin Matusko, 116 Stockbridge. Uh, you know, Knightley Road, that's been, that culvert's been in need of repair for the last year and a half. 
why are we waiting so long to fix something that's deteriorating so bad it's pretty much daily and there's some trees that fell over on either side of the culvert I do hope this money includes removal of those trees thank you uh, yes I, the trees will be taken care of yes Um, I just, um, I, I, as I said earlier, we had to go through conservation. You got uh, an emergency certification a year and a half ago to fix this project from the CONCOM. Uh, no, they just gave us approval, okay, let's April not 13th. Argue, let's not argue about that, please. April 13th, we just got uh, approval from the you, conservation. You just got approval, but you got an emergency yes. certification to fix the culvert a year and a half ago. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Dina Friedman, 16 Barstow Lane. I totally understand the need to have access to water tanks, and yet any time trees are removed, we just had a discussion about energy code. Is there any plan to replant trees somewhere else to offset those trees that will need to be removed? Thank you very much for your question. At this time, uh, there is no plan, but that's a good that's a good plan. That's a good question. Uh, this time, the reason why we don't have the tree, the tree shade committee, one of their goals is to plant trees. We did uh, an event once before the, before the pandemic set in. That was on the commons, uh, but I, because of the pandemics, the tree shade committee has not been able to make such decision. Now that we are coming out of it, I'm sure they will consider this as part of the next it things on their item. Yeah, I would, I would love it if that could be referred to that and that when, as a town, when we think about removing trees for good reason, we also continue to think about planting them. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, this vote requires a two-thirds majority. And I just have a vote of 53 voters here, so all those in favor, please signify by raising your cards. passes 149 to 4. All right. Article 14. Randy Phil, 39 Knightley Road. I'd like to move Article 25 to be the next two so far. Uh, so you're asking to move on to Article 25 now. Okay, and unless I have very compelling evidence to do so, I'm going to deny that motion. Okay, I said she wants to make she makes she's making a motion to move an article from its place in the warrant, meaning she wants to take it up next. It's Article 25, and unless I hear very compelling reasons to do so, I will not allow it because if I do, at any town meeting, people are going to say, "Well, I want to hear this now. I want to hear that now," and the select board spent all kinds of time putting this together, so I'm not inclined to take things out of order okay does everybody understand everybody hear me okay so i deny that motion okay so now we're going to article 14. which i have wrong in my paperwork as well anyhow Article 14 is a levy assessment study phase two. Finance committee, select board, and capital planning all are in favor of this unanimously. And motion 14, move that the town vote to appropriate $150,000 to fund phase two of the levy assessment as presented at the May 22nd, 2001 annual town meeting and incorporated by reference herein and to fund said appropriation for the fund said appropriation the town treasurer with the approval of the selectmen 
is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 44, Section 7, 8, or pursuant to any other enabling authority and to issue bonds or notes of the town therefore. Any premium received upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, lest any such premium applied to the payment of the cost of issuance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 20, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount. Do I have a motion? I have a motion and a second. Carolyn Brennan will speak to this. I would like to introduce two representatives from Woodard and Curran who have been helping the town staff review the needs and next steps for the Hadley Flood Protection System over the past year. Woodard and Curran is a national, national engineering and consulting firm as well as a utility contract operations company. Scott Medeiros is a senior client manager in their Enfield, Connecticut office, and Rich Niles is a project manager in their Andover, Andover Mass office. Rich has been working with the town actually be before 2014, um, as, and, but this part is uh, since as part of a phased approach to evaluate the conditions of the dike. So Rich and Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, thanks for having me here and inviting me to your public meeting. I didn't get the memo about the no ties, so uh, uh, I apologize for that. I simply stick out. Oh, remember, uh, you guys have a handout in your packet here. So if you haven't looked at that already, I'll be talking, uh, kind of going through this, doing a brief overview for maybe five minutes. We'll hopefully have some discussion and questions. All right, it's <laughs> off to a great start, aren't we? Um, <clears throat> so I've been working with the town for about several years um, to evaluate the condition and review the eligibility for certification for the town's dike. Is everybody familiar with where the dike is located? Okay, anybody not? All right, I'll skip that part then. Um, so the dike provides protection against what FEMA calls the 100-year floodplain or the 100-year flood elevation. Um, and the town began evaluating this uh, following a um, failure of one of the embankments along the Connecticut River. Um, so we began, we began a phased approach to evaluate the condition and see whether it would meet certification criteria that FEMA establishes, which is a high bar to meet that criteria. If you don't meet that criteria in the future, when FEMA does remapping of the floodplains, they won't recognize that the levy actually exists and the properties that are currently protected would have to purchase flood insurance. So we started this process to evaluate whether we could meet that criteria, and we do it in a phased manner because it is costly to do the engineering certification. But we also want to identify whether there's any critical flaws along the way. So we got about halfway through the study, um, and in about 2018, we, we provided a report that said that there were significant deficiencies for the embankment stability along the Connecticut River. Now, that doesn't mean that it's unsafe necessarily. It just doesn't meet the highest FEMA criteria. So we suggested that the town take an approach to evaluate the cost to remediate that, as well as the rail trail embankment, which is considered part of the levy system. So people may not think of the rail trail as part of the dike, but it actually is. That's providing flood protection, that barrier, the physical barrier. That also does not meet criteria. Um, the challenge with doing any upgrades to the rail trail is that it has trees along it, it has buildings very close to it. So in order to do that, we would have to dramatically change the character of that system, and it's also owned by DCR, which adds another challenge. So we suggested that we look at the necessary repairs for the Connecticut River section, and instead of looking at what we would do to the rail trail, do we consider for maybe a comparable cost, but significantly more benefit, do we consider doing something along Bay Road, which would provide flood protection for a much greater part of the community? So the actual, the floodplain comes up to the ball fields here, where we're at. It comes up to the back to the academy here and encompasses the entire downtown area all the way back to um, Cross Path Road, which is where the, the dike starts and heads towards the Connecticut River. So we're suggesting to look at and do an alternatives analysis 
to see uh, what the economic benefit would be of a new levy system along here, but also addressing issues associated with the current system. One of the challenges we, we faced with um, this next phase of the project is obviously funding. And the reason this one article is before you is because we, we evaluated alternative funding sources, what's available through FEMA, the state, the, the MVP program, if people have ever heard of that, it's the Massachusetts Vulnerability Preparedness Program. Uh, the town went through a plan and, de and developed a strategy and listed this as one of the number one projects in that plan to address the risk of flooding. The problem is the MVP program doesn't have adequate money to fund it, and we, had a, we, we submitted an application and they, and they said it wasn't fundable. So we tried that avenue. There's other programs like Dam, Levy, and Seawall. Massachusetts funds uh, rehabilitation of those systems, but you have to have design plans ready and ready to go to construction, and they'll fund construction. So the next level of capital investment has funding opportunities that can help uh, support that. However, we, we need to get to a project that is we think is feasible, that we have a conceptual design for. And that's what this, this, uh, sco this effort would achieve. In addition to evaluating these alternatives and whether the town wants to pursue a different system uh, or, or continue funding uh, repairs to the existing system, there's some kind of rudimentary activities that we'll perform, which should be done on a regular basis anyway. We have to do inspections of the toe of the levee, which is along the, uh, along the river, to see if there's any erosion. Uh, we have to look at the pipes that go through the levee, those drainage pipes that go through it. So those have never been inspected. We want to make sure that those function properly, they don't compromise the integrity of the embankment. We also want, uh, need to develop an operation and maintenance plan so DPW has more clear guidance and direction on how to properly inspect and maintain the system. And these are really basic things that any funding agency is going to look at and say that you, you need to be doing your basic monitoring and maintenance and have some of these plans in place in order to be eligible for funding. So we're suggesting that, that we, we take this approach that will allow for public engagement, engagement with the agencies, identify funding sources and alternatives, and then um, ultimately you know, engage the public as part of that process to make a decision on how you move forward. So this is to help develop enough information and cost to consider what those next steps might be. With that, I think I'll turn over to uh, questions and comments. Anybody have any questions regarding this? Yeah. Tony Lynn Morelli, 127 Rocky Hill. Is it possible to coordinate the, your work with what's being done with the Route 9 big project to, for some cost savings? Um, Carol, we've talked about that briefly. Um, we're not sure about whether the timing will work. We're certainly going to consider that the widening would change the level of effort to go across the road. So if we were to do something along Bay Road, we have to connect it to the existing levee. And if you guys have driven through Northampton near Smith College, you've seen the walls that come right up to the road. Maybe not the most aesthetically pleasing, but some type of closure structure would be required across Route 9. So those are all part of the feasibility analysis to look at what are the impacts to the uh, properties that abut all that. Um, certainly there's a benefit to the properties that have to obtain flood insurance now that are within the floodplain, which is a significant amount of property, hotels, gas stations, you know, lots of residential property. But what it looks like as it goes through people's backyards or abutting properties, you know, it'll be an earth and berm, but some areas where there's stream crossings or there's road crossings, there will be structures. So uh, as best as possible, yeah, we'd want to coordinate with other upcoming infrastructure projects so to gain some efficiency. But this is just to consider conceptual design. This is not anything close to construction and final design. That's a good question. David Ryman, 310 River Drive. Um, is there any attempt to evaluate um, an impact on neighboring communities? If, if we were to increase the flood protection of Hadley, how does that affect the flood uh, floodplain of Hatfield, for example? Yeah, no, that's another another great question. Um, do you have a science degree <laughs> or engineering degree? <laughs> um, not many people think of that. Is what are the downstream impacts? If we mitigate, you build a, a essentially a barrier. You're cutting out floodplain. So that's part of this project is to analyze, and, and we, we do a hydraulic model of the river, and we simulate what that change would result in, and is it going to raise the flood elevation downstream or not? So that's a very important factor. The other thing that's really important to consider is that, you know, floodplains are considered a resource area. Uh, we're looking at protecting 
property, so there's a huge economic benefit to that, but there's certainly environmental impact associated with that too. So this initial engagement is to talk to those agencies as well and get feedback to see, that's part of the feasibility piece, to see is it economically and environmentally feasible and what are the costs, if any, to mitigate for some of those impacts. So this is what we're, we're trying to, we try to craft this approach to give all the right information to, to address some of those initial concerns and have a, 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 uh, enough information to make a decision as to how the town wants to move forward, but there will be multiple next steps. There's significant permitting associated with th that type of system. So. Okay, I got one more coming from the way back. Westry. Is this a no bid contract? No other bids? So the, the question is, is this a no bid contract? You, you mean for our work? I'm, I'm not under contract right now. <laughs> for the work in but, but the work we do is, is there's a process for, for bidding at the town. Um, can Engineering services don't require solicitation of bids, but the town can certainly do that. Yep. It, it can be. Okay, anybody else have any questions? All right, seeing none, this is a two-thirds majority vote as well. All those in favor, signify by raising your cards. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Moving on to Article 15, the Omnibus Budget General Fund. Before I read this motion, I would entertain a motion to waive the reading of the line items. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, typically the line items of the budget get read individually by members of the Finance Committee. It takes quite some time and it's kind of, you know, it's all in front of you in, in your paperwork. So, uh, I see nobody has any questions. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes. All right. I will go on and read the motion. Move that $18,057,707 be appropriated for the maintenance and operation of the town in fiscal year 2022 and fix the salaries of all elected officials as recommended in individual general fund budgets listed in the handout, finance committee budget fiscal year 2022, and as funding therefore, raise and appropriate and transfer from available funds the estimated amounts in table A.1, as presented at the May 22nd, 2021 annual town meeting and incorporated by reference herein. Uh, Finance Committee, can you, or somebody give just a quick overview, please? Quickly. Okay. Um, just preparing the budget was very lengthy and it involved the finance committee, myself, uh, the select board and department heads. And although the town experienced a drop in local revenues during COVID-19, impacting both FY20 and FY21, we will have over 500,000 in replacement revenue from the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan. This will allow our town departments to maintain a level service budget for FY22 and with the hope and the expectation um, that revenues will return to normal in FY23. Just some, I just wanna point out a couple things about the budget. There were no employee layoffs. There were no significant reduction in services. Uh, thankful to the, the CARES Act that did help us um, adapt to providing services through COVID-19. Uh, there was a 1.5% cost of living increase for employees. Uh, the local contribution to the school department was level funded. They were able to do this by utilizing school choice and COVID related expenses were also being re reimbursed by grants. For the second year in a row, we did delay contributions to OPEB, the OPEB trust fund. Uh, we preserved sufficient free cash for paybacks to stabilization, stabilization accounts in the fall and we maintained our AAA bond rating. Okay, I made a mistake. I forgot to get a motion and a second for the main motion, so. Okay, I got a motion and a second, and we're good. 
Okay, anybody have any questions on the budget? Jonah Berger, 21 North Water Drive. Um, in past town meetings, there's been small, like no more than a thousand dollars here or there changes between what was read and what's on the paper. Can we just confirm that this is exactly the latest that Finance Committee has? Yes, it is. Great, thanks. You're welcome. <clears throat> Mr. Phil. David Phil, 39 Knightley Road. I just wanted to say thank you to the uh, school committee and the school department because uh, their willingness to chip in and, and to give back some money last year and also to basically level fund this year uh, enabled us to keep all of our services level and, and keep the taxes as low as possible. So I just want to say thanks to the school committee and the school. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by raising your cards. Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Article 16, recommended unanimously by the Finance Committee and the Select Board, uh, Budget Combined Enterprise Fund, moved that nine hundred fifty two thousand three hundred thirty five dollars recommended in the handout finance committee budget fiscal year 2022 be appropriated to the fiscal year 2022 water division enterprise fund to be expended for the respective purposes set forth and is funding therefore raise and appropriate and transfer from available funds the estimated amounts in table b.1 as presented at the may 22nd 2021 annual town meeting and incorporated by reference herein and further moved that $1,137,369 recommended in the handout Finance Committee Budget Fiscal Year 2022 be appropriated to the Fiscal Year 2022 Water Enterprise Fund to be expended for the respective purposes set forth and as funding therefore raise and appropriate and transfer from available funds the estimated amounts in Table B.1 as presented at the May 22nd, 2021 annual town meeting and incorporated by reference herein, and further move that $69,102 recommended in the handout Finance Committee Budget Fiscal Year 2022 be appropriated to the Fiscal Year 2022 Hadley Media Enterprise Fund to be expended for the respective purposes set forth and as funding therefore raise and appropriate and transfer from available funds the estimated amounts in table B.1 as presented at the May 22nd, 2021 annual town meeting and incorporated by reference herein. Do I have a motion? A motion and a second. Who will speak to this? The, in, the explanation I gave was for really both those budgets. Anybody have any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, Article 17 is water borrowing and it's broken down into two separate motions. So both motions are recommended unanimously by the Capital Planning Committee, Finance Committee, and Select Board. So motion 17A, water borrowing, moved that the town appropriate $805,000 to pay costs of engineering, permitting, construction, and all other costs associated with replacing water lines along Route 9 for the Department of Public Works, the payment of all costs incidental and related thereto, and that to meet this appropriation, the treasurer with the approval of the select board is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to chapter 44, section eight, subsection five of the general laws and or chapter 29C of the general laws as most recently amended by statute 1998, chapter 78, that such bonds or notes shall be general obligations of the town unless the treasurer with the approval of the select board, the 
determines that they should be issued as limited obligations and may be secured by local system revenues as defined in section one of chapter 29C as most recently amended by statute 1998, chapter 78, that the Water Commission is authorized to expend all funds available for the project and to take any other action necessary to carry out the project. Any premium received by the town upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, lest any such premium applied to the payment of the costs of issuance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the General Laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount. Do I have a motion? I have a motion and a second. Second. And Carolyn, are you going to speak to this? And the explanation... Excuse me one minute. The explanation you're going to get for, for motion 17, or Article 17A is going to be the same basic thing for 17B. It's being combined into one project, two different fundings. Okay, I'll start. If you have more questions, Chris can go into a little bit of the details. But as you know, uh, the Route 9 widening project is starting next year. Uh, the town has an opportunity to um, do some uh, replacement of water and sewer lines along Route 9 and this will save about a million dollars to the town to do it in tandem with uh, MassDOT. So this is um, what we're presenting to you. Also, actually next week I'll be submitting a grant to MassWorks with the hopes that that uh, 800, um, sorry, 925,000 would be uh, reimbursed by uh, the state. So that's the intent. It looks hopeful. We have support from our legislators on it. So. Chris, how did I do? Anything more? Okay. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on this one? Hearing none, all those in favor? This requires two thirds. Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, Article 17B. Again, this is uh, recommended unanimously Capital Planning, Finance Committee, and Select Board. Move that the town appropriate $120,000 to pay costs of engineering, permitting, construction, and all other costs associated with, replace, re, with replacing sewer lines along Route 9 for the Department of Public Works, the payment of all costs incidental and related thereto, and that to meet this appropriation, the Treasurer, with the approval of the Select Board, authorize to borrow said amount under and pursuant to Chapter 44, Section 8, Subsection 14 of the General Laws and or Chapter 29C of the General Laws as most recently amended by Statute 1998, Chapter 78, that such bonds or notes shall be general obligations of the town unless the Treasurer, with the approval of the Select Board, determines that they should be issued as limited obligations and may be secured by local system revenues as defined in section one of chapter 29C as most recently amended by statute 1998, chapter 78, that the sewer commission is authorized to expend all funds available for the project and to take any other action necessary to carry out the project. Any premium received by the town upon the sale of any bonds or note approved by this vote, lest any such premium apply to the payment of the cost of issuance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the General Laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount. Do I have a motion? I have a motion and a second. So this is basically in keeping with the last uh, sewer instead of water. Any questions out there? Seeing none, all those in favor, this is two-thirds also. Signify by raising your cards. Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, Article 18, purchase of a used ambulance. And select board recommends this 401, Finance Committee 500 recommended, and Capital Planning recommended 400. So, move 
that the town appropriate $20,000 to pay costs for an ambulance for the fire department, including the payment of all costs incidental and related hereto, and that to meet the appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the select board, is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to Chapter 44, Section 7, Subsection 1 of the general laws, or pursuant to any other enabling authority, and to issue bonds or notes of the town, therefore. Any premium received by the town upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, lest any such premium applied to the payment of the cost of issuance of such bonds or notes, may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the General Laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to, costs, to such costs by a like amount. Do I have a motion? Second. I have a motion and a second. Mr. Spectable will speak to this, please. Good afternoon. Uh, so this is uh, a request for 20,000. Uh, the city of Northampton is taking one of their ambulances out of service right now. They have a very robust capital plan and rotate their ambulances out every two years. Uh, there's been a long line of communities waiting for these to go out and they committed to the, the town of Hadley. Uh, we have signed a letter of intent based upon funding. Uh, this is a 2009 Chevy C4500 PL Custom and uh, it has been gone through by our mechanic at the fire station and it has just over 100,000 miles on it right now. Uh, it's in immaculate condition. They have all the maintenance records for it for us and they are including everything in the ambulance with it. Um, we've had a capital request in for about 10 years now. It's part of the five year plan of the fire department, including uh, the study that was done in 2012 on the fire department was to move towards a basic ambulance service. This is not taking over for our action ALS ambulance. This is in support of that. As of right now, if our action med one uh, is out on a call, uh, we actually have to request mutual aid or if their secondary ambulance that comes up from Holyoke is in town then that ambulance will respond. Uh, we average about between 100 and 150 calls a year that we're missing with our Action Med 1. So the hope is to continue with improving response times and then also bring in some revenue to the community uh, for, by, by putting this ambulance in place. The ambulance is not slated to come out of service in Northampton until the fall. They're in the process of building their new one. And uh, again, we've gone through it top to bottom. I can tell you that the power lift that's in the ambulance alone is a $38,000 piece of equipment. And they're including all the radios in it as well, which is a substantial amount of money as well. Uh, so we have a really good opportunity here. Uh, it will take us a, a few months to put it in service with training and we have that plan ready to go. Uh, we do have a number of new members that are all uh, very excited to start practicing their EMT skills. And you all drive Route 9 every day and you see the number of accidents we tend to have here where it's multiple cars, where we have to have multiple ambulances come into town. And uh, our mutual, mutual aid partners are actually very excited that we're looking to do this as well so we can reciprocate back and forth with this. Um, the North, Northampton has called us mutual aid a number of times, Sunderland, uh, so we're actually adding another resource to our community. It will be operated uh, during the day by our firefighters that are on duty. Myself and the deputy are also EMTs, so we would backfill the ambulance as well. Uh, there's no intent to hire new staffing at this time. And we are also in discussions with the University of Massachusetts for a hybrid plan. They have over 130 EMTs on campus during the school year. Uh, we, we tried to get it started last year, but there were no students on campus as part of that program. Uh, so the hope is to bring them in and have them uh, be a part of our service as well. So I don't know if anybody has any questions, but we'd appreciate your support. Okay, anybody have any questions? Sharon Parsons, 137 Mill Valley Road. My question is this, the ambulance is in North Hadley. Does that mean someone is going to be assigned to that station on a regular basis for them to use that ambulance? Um, and will this not eventually mean a new staff person that will have to stay up there in North Hadley? At $20,000, I have no problem. Sounds like a great deal. But further down the road, it won't be a great deal if that costs us another sixty, sixty-five thousand 65000 a year for salary for someone to stay there with the ambulance. 
Yeah, there is no intent on hiring new staff at this time. Uh, this is strictly for the daytime staff, and again, the overnight would be call force. Again, this is the second ambulance out the door. We have a contract with Action Ambulance right now. Our ALS ambulance will be going out the door. It's in the event if we have a second call during that time that we need to cover, uh, we will have that option. So that, that's the reason. Uh, there's no intent at this, at this time. We actually did have in the budget last year, but we had the hiring freeze of bringing on board an additional firefighter, but that, that was uh, put to the side and is not in this budget either. Shell. Shell Horowitz, 16 Barstow Lane. Chief, I just would like your clarification. Um, you said it, they're rotating out every two years, but it's in 2009. Uh, my math says 12 years, so can you just explain that? Yeah, they have five or six ambulances. So the oldest ambulance is now their reserve ambulance, and so it's over 10, 12 years. And what? Edwin Matusko, 116 Stockbridge Street. First of all, um, what are all these borrowing going to do to the tax rate? That's the very first question. The second question is, are we going to be here a year from now saying we got an 11- or 12-year-old ambulance saying we got to replace it now because it's too old? Uh, it's, I don't, you know, we've got DPW trucks that are newer than this, and it's not an ambulance. Thank you. What about the bar? Hang on, one at a time, please. What, what about the borrowing situation? Okay. What's that going to do to the tax rate? Who can answer that first, please? Should be. Get closer. No. It's not on now. Hang on, Linda. Edwin, you should. There you go. Now you, you I hear you're you. On. Hang on, Linda, you're not on again. Doing anything. I'm not touching. How's that? Awesome. No more. Did it go out again? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, no. Town treasurer. Okay. What does it do to the tax rate? It actually doesn't do anything in the short run. The battery must be dying. Four. Bring this. Maybe it'll work for me. Okay. All right. We have built into our um, our budget about three hundred thousand dollars worth of payment of debt and interest for borrowings within the levy every year, and that's a stable amount. For that means is it still working. Okay. That means each year that we borrow about that same amount, two to three, on articles like this, to be paid within the levy, it's going to slip in light on in the in the budget. So that's our current best capital plan for spending about uh, up to two, two, three hundred thousand, sometimes a little more because we don't always borrow all authorized. At, that our best capital plan for short term, smaller items like what we have paid for today is to put them, um, is to pay, to borrow them within the levy and keep it going um, with the budget. So that allows the budget to be fairly, uh, the debt and interest portion of the budget to be fairly level from year to year. Thank you. Check one, two, okay. Yep. Go ahead. George, George Moriarty, 22 Chamorro Road. Um, I was probably on the ambulance committee for a long time. Many years of going through the budgets, uh, going through ambulance uh, proposals and when we did this two years ago um, the reason we didn't go into the fire department ambulance was there's a lot of pitfalls uh, in my opinion um, you have liability you have billing issues you have all these issues that come up um, as we stands right now our contract 
is is a no win. Our first year, I think they rebated gotcha. almost all the money that was contracted. Uh, last year, I think I'm, I may say, I think they charged us only 150,000. Uh, so they rebated probably close to 100,000. By taking over some of their, their runs from their second ambulance, they have no problem doing that. We take them, we, then we have to try to make money at it or at least break even. They're just gonna bill us the difference. Um, as, as it stands, we have a, a no win I mean, we can't lose with the contract we have right now. They put an ambulance, a second ambulance in our town when it's the busy time. Granted, it's not guaranteed, but we're only paying for one ambulance. And they gave us majority of the money back for the two years. I haven't heard what next year is going to be, um, where they stand. But to us, and, and even when we went through the, the entire uh, committee, which was years, you know, we always had this, this conversations with the fire chief um, that they want to run this themselves. And I think the liability, and they will be hires because the idea that there's a bad accident and the ambulance rolls, the two fire, full-time firefighters are going to be bringing the fire trucks, the rescue equipment there. They're not going to be bringing the ambulance. So eventually, whether it's next year or the year after, yes, we are the person asked. We will be asked to hire more firefighters and more uh, expenses and, and, and uh, retirement funds and all that stuff. So I think the town has to be weary. We have, a, in my opinion, an excellent system right now, which costs us, I'm not gonna say nothing because it changes every year, but I think because of COVID there was a lot less runs. So they charged us a stipend of, of whatever the number was, 150,000, I think. So at this point to, to add a whole nother service to our fire department, will end up costing the town more money and it will cost more firefighters in the future because we're not going to have a fire truck at the scene because the ambulance is there so some of the statements to me doesn't make sense um and i think the town really has to look at if we're going to go into the ambulance business that they need to look at all the pitfalls all the liabilities all the billing issues and everything that comes with it now where now it costs us for the first year, cost us nothing. The second year, cost us a hundred thousand dollars. So, finish up, please. Yep, I'm done. Okay, good time. If I could just uh, respond to that. Sure. So there is no, again, there is no anticipation of new hiring at this point. Um, they, we're talking about trying to bring additional revenue. This is not taking revenue out of action. Our primary ambulance service. Like I said, we're calling. Northampton, Amherst, South Hadley, uh, Action Med 2 if they're in town, and all those revenues are going to those communities and that ambulance service. So what we're trying to do is remain consistent. Our goal is to be able to get to your house within four to five minutes. I, I mean, anybody that knows about a heart attack or a stroke, the time frame for us to get there is critical. I can tell you that the majority of your communities in Massachusetts have fire-based EMS now. Um, while they're still backed up by private ambulance services, um, we're, we've done this evaluation, it's actually in that uh, 2012 study, and if you consider an, an uh, average BLS ambulance ride to the hospital, it's between $1,000 and $1,500. Not to say that you're going to get all of that with Medicare and Medicaid. Um, again, I don't particularly like talking about the revenue side, but I know it's important. What I look at is if we have the ability to roll a second ambulance because we have somebody that's that's, uh, that's injured in a motor vehicle accident, or if we have our primary ambulance at at, uh, at the mall and we have somebody that has a heart attack or a stroke in town, we can get that ambulance going. We have mutual aid agreements and intercept agreements with the communities around us where if we package you as a patient, the goal, the ultimate goal is to get into the hospital. So we're putting you in our ambulance and we're intercepting an advanced level of care at the bridge. So you're going to the hospital, we're decreasing that time frame, and then we bill out for that. And as far as billing, Action Ambulance has offered to do all the billing for us so we wouldn't have to hire a company to do it. They take a small percentage of that revenue out of it. And all of this has been discussed in the Ambulance Oversight Committee. And uh, I, I just, I'm, again, I'm just making this recommendation to your community. I think it's an important asset to it um and again it's part of the you know the the plan for the department 
we're, we're at a tipping point now. We're responding to over 1,500 calls a year now. And, you know, at 6 o'clock, we go to a call force fire department. There's no full-time staff other than the one ambulance that you have. So your call volunteers, a number of them are in the audience right now, and myself and the deputy are the ones coming out at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, and, and making sure that people have services. So, again, are we looking to build out the fire department at some point? Excuse me, yes, but not right now. Thank you. Sir. Jonah Bruger, 21 Norwalk Drive. What do we expect the service life to be on a 2009 ambulance? Um, and how much will it cost if we don't get a used one? The capital, the capital request uh, is 283000 for a new ambulance. <clears throat> so we're looking at, obviously, a pretty good deal. Uh, we're looking for five years, establishing a revenue account so that we wouldn't be coming back to ask to pay for you to pay for the second ambulance. The revenues coming in from our transports would be paying that uh, paying that bill. Thank you. Molly? Uh, Molly Keegan, Hadley Ambulance Oversight Committee. Um, George is right. Several years ago, when we met, oh, okay. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, Hadley Ambulance Oversight Committee. Um, George is right from the standpoint that a few years back there was concern about making an investment internally. Since that time, we contracted with Action. It has gone beautifully, um, but a lot has changed in the past couple of years as well and not the least of which is the opportunity to solidify a relationship with the University of Massachusetts. So um, our committee absolutely supports this $20,000 investment. Nobody is adding to staff now. We have to rely on the budget deliberations in the future years if that comes up. But again, this is almost a no-brainer for the town to do this. Mr. Moriarty. George Moriarty, 22 Trimmer Road. Uh, one thing is when we're on the animus committee, we had the, the data of uh, what insurance companies truly pay. And Mike had mentioned that a BLS is billed out at $1,500, and it's probably true. But when we looked at it three years ago, the majority of it, they paid between $350 and, and about $700, $800 for the best insurance companies, what they would reimburse. So without truly looking into it, I think there should be tabled if the fire department is truly going to look at this and and start building a five-year plan we should really know what what the outcome how much it's going to really cost what it's going to do to our firefighters that we have enough firefighters which during the day we do not if they're out running ambulance calls and there's a fire we're back in the same game or the problem that we're calling mutual aid in and we got you know who, how long so i think at this point you know that we had looked at the numbers on the committee three years ago. Did the numbers change? Possibly. But why are we going to jump into a whole new service bracket? Um, furthermore, our, our firefighters that are on call, they respond directly to the scene immediately. Granted, there may not be an ambulance there, but there's going to be one there from Amherst and Northampton very quickly. So I think at some point, it, the, you know, more, more eyes should look at it and see if it's even uh, feasible that with the deal we have right now, which is, it's not free, but it's as close as we can get with no liability and uh, thank you. Sir. My name is Tim O'Hara. I live on 209 Russell Street, Harry. Uh, I can tell you right now, I went to the hospital last year, twice in the ambulance. Did I have to wait 15 minutes like I, when the ambulance was running? No. I timed it. The time they left the station till they got to my house, they were there in 15 seconds. If you people don't want ambulance in this town, you're going to lose the chief, you're going to lose everybody. So do what you want. You know, you people just put up a library for a millions of dollars, and the chief wants 20000 $20, and he has to drop with the bucket. So wake up, people. Thank you. Joyce? Well, y'all know I'm older than dirt around here. And I've been, uh, even when I was on school committee, I was on an ambulance committee back then with Joe Fitzgibbons, and we both are up there in age. So we've always talked about an ambulance service and committee. I also was on the same committee as George. Yes, at that time, we didn't feel that um, putting an ambulance service in place 
at that point was a good financial thing for the town. Um, so henceforth we went with Action Ambulance instead of Amherst and it has very well served our town. But now we have expanded, we have more calls, and being in the medical field I know what it costs for an ambulance to come and pick you up and it's not cheap. So basic life support is just a basic life support. It's not an advanced life support ALS. So there's two different services here that we're asking for. Advanced life support, you have to have certain paramedics on the scene when you're getting picked up by an ambulance. Basic life support is when we can go pick you up and take you to the hospital and maybe intercept with another ambulance. That is ALS. So it's a matter of time well spent. $20,000 is a drop in the bucket for what it would actually take for us to buy an actual ambulance. Um, a th 100,000 miles on a vehicle that's a diesel, we've just broken that ambulance in. I mean, think about diesel trucks. I mean, those things run for a long time. So I think we're getting a good deal. I'd like everybody to support this. Thank you. Mr. Phil. David Phil, 39 Knightley Road. As most of you know, I hate spending money, and uh, but I do support this uh, $20,000 investment in the ambulance. I'd like to give uh, the chief and the fire department a chance to see if they can make it financially feasible to generate revenue. And if I'm still sitting here and whenever the time comes to buy the next one, and if they have to come back to the taxpayers, I'll say no. But if they can generate the money to, to pay for a new ambulance, then I say give them a chance. Worst case is we're getting way more than $20,000 worth of equipment. So, Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, this is a two-thirds majority vote. All in favor, signify by raising your cards. Thank you. Any opposed? Eleven no. Motion passes. All right, the next four articles are for APR funding, and there's two articles for each piece of property because of the, the source of the funding. So we just have to muddle through and, and get it. So Article 20 is for Berlinski APR and CPA funding. Uh, to see if the town will vote to appropriate $5,500 from the Community Preservation Act Open Space Fund for the purpose of acquiring an agricultural preservation restriction on all or a portion of the parcel of the property known as the Grolinski Farm located off River Road or Drive, Assessor's Map 6B, Parcel 1 and 2, and to authorize the Select Board to enter into such agreements on behalf of the town as may be necessary for the town to be a co-holder of said APR with such conditions to include that the applicant would have two years from the date of approval to spend the funding and if not spent any remaining funds would revert back to a to Community Preservation Act Open Space Fund or take any action relative thereto. And uh, Community Preservation Act Committee, Finance Committee and Select Board all unanimously recommend this. Do I have a motion? A motion and a second. Anybody want to speak to this? Okay. Paulette, you want to talk? Paulette Kazdeba, 40 Knightley Road, Chair of the Conservation Commission. This is part of the ongoing um, responsibility of the Conservation Commission to try and preserve as much agricultural land in Hadley as possible. And as you'll see coming up, um, Article 22, the Conservation Commission is doing the other 50% of the um, match to the town. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously.
Article 21 is the Handrich APR CPA funding. Move to appropriate $13,000 from the Community Preservation Act Open Space Fund for the purpose of acquiring an agricultural preservation restriction on all or a portion of the parcel of the property known as the Handrich Trust located off Moody Bridge Road, Assessor's Map 9, Parcel 21, and portion of Parcel 21A, and to authorize the Select Board to enter into such agreements on behalf of the town as may be necessary for the town to be a co-holder of said APR with such conditions to include the applicant would have two years from the date of approval to spend the funding, and if not spent, any remaining funds would revert back to Community Preservation Act Open Space Fund. Do I have a motion? I have a motion and a second. Any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Article 22, we're back to the Grilinski property APR. This is being funded by the Conservation Commission. To see if the town will vote to appropriate $5,500 from the Conservation Commission's TDR fund, which is transfer of development rights, for the purpose of acquiring an agricultural preservation restriction on all or a portion of the parcel of the property known as the Grilinski Farm, located off River Road or Drive, Assessor's Map 6B, Parcel 1 and 2, and to authorize the Select Board to enter into such agreements on behalf of the town as may be necessary for the town to be a co-holder of said APR or take any action relative thereto. And CONCOM, FINCOM, and Select Board all unanimously recommend this. A motion and a second. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Article 23 is the Handrich, back to the Handrich APR Conservation Commission funding, and again, CONCOM, FINCOM, and SELECT BOARD all unanimously recommend this. To see if the town will vote to appropriate $13,000 from the Conservation Commission's TDR fund for the purpose of acquiring an agricultural preservation restriction on all or a portion of the parcel of the property known as the Handrich Trust, located off Moody Bridge Road, Assessor's Map 9, Parcel 21, and a portion of Parcel 21A, and to authorize the select board to enter into such agreements on behalf of the town as may be necessary for the town to be a co-holder of said APR. A motion and a second. Any questions? Andy. And Andy Morris, Friedman, 45 Roosevelt Street. Does anyone know offhand how many acres in APR this brings us to? I know Alexandra Dawson's goal was 5,000. I just want to make sure we're ahead of Amherst. <laughs> Does anybody know the answer to the question? My understand, Pollock Kazdeba, 40 Knightley Road, chair, to, uh, chair of the Conservation Commission. My understanding, we are the number one community in the state for agricultural preservation. Yeah, do you know the acreage, Paulette, by any chance? No. Okay. All right, thank you. All right. Article 24 is... Uh, oh, do we? Okay, well then, let, let's. <laughs> Don't be so picky at it. All right, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Now can I go to Article 24? Okay, thank you. Article 24 is... Uh, First Congregational Church seeking CPA funds to fix the steeple clock. Uh, this is recommended unanimously by Con uh, CPC, the Community Preservation Committee, the Finance Committee, and the Select Board. Move that the town vote to appropriate $13,500 from the Community Preservation Act General Fund to the First Congregational Church for the purpose of repair and restoration of the 1909 Seth Thomas clock located in the historic center of Hadley and to enter into an agreement or agreements as necessary 
with such conditions to include that the applicant would have two years from the date of approval to spend the funding, and if not spent, any remaining funds would revert back to Community Preservation Act general fund or take any action relative thereto. Do I have a motion? Motion and a second. Anybody want to speak to this? Mr. Shah. Uh, John Shot 7 Quinlan Drive. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the uh, clock was donated to the church uh, in 1909. And since 1909, the, it has had a little maintenance to it over the years. It is showing its age. Uh, it is a hand-wound hand clock. Uh, it, some of you might remember probably past... January or last January and into the fall last year, we the clock was basically at a standstill. Uh, and a lot of the parts are getting very worn uh, and they need to be uh, war uh, replaced and or uh, remachined. A lot of the uh, cable wiring that does uh, function with the clock uh, dials themselves is starting to fray and that also needs to be fully replaced. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Diana West, 164 South Maple Street. I currently serve as the chairperson of the Hadley Historical Commission, and we were asked to write a letter in support of this project, which we happily did. Uh, there was concerns about the separation of church and state. Uh, this clock was installed for the 250th anniversary of the town of Hadley, and we feel that um, because the town of Hadley's history is so intertwined with the church, we felt that it would be an appropriate project for CPA money to preserve the clock, as well as this is the outside of the building, so it's not preserving anything that is religiously related. So we felt that in order to keep the clock, keep it running, it would preserve the historic center of the town. Thank you. Andy. Andy Morris, Friedman, 45 Roosevelt Street. For over 100 years, people living in Hadley have been looking up to that clock tower to see what time it is. Now it's only right twice a day. Uh, this will uh, keep the clock running and keep the historic view shed of that part of Hadley as it's been for the past 100 years. There's a three-part test by the uh, state Supreme Court um, for using uh, Community Preservation Act funds um, as part of a building in a religious institution, and this uh, project passes all three. So um, I say vote yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor? Thank you. On any opposed? Motion passes. All right, Article 25. Okay, Article 25 is the Planning Board River Bylaws. I know there's a lot of people here for this, and once this we get through this question, please try to stay. There's only a couple more articles after this. We'd like to be able to finish up everything if possible. So this is a zoning article which requires a two-thirds majority to pass. So the motion. The, the, oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Motion first, then you'll tell me. Move that the town amend the zoning bylaws as delineated in Article 25 of the warrant of the annual town meeting held on May 22, 2021, and incorporated by reference herein, that the town clerk may make formatting and numbering changes as necessary to preserve consistency of the zoning bylaws. Now, this, okay, I got a motion and a second. Mr. Maximoski. Planning Board recommends this article 5-0 unanimously. There's a couple sections to this bylaw. One is it replaces section 13 of the existing bylaws 
and it takes the definitions out of the section and puts them into the new section 1.2 that we approved earlier in the meeting. That's simple. What this bylaw does, basically this bylaw has been rewritten to comply with the new so-called MS4 uh, bylaw, MS4 bylaw of the law of the state. It's a general law and it's got to do with environmental protection, wetlands, and a whole bunch of other things. If this bylaw doesn't pass, a couple of things will happen. Um, the riverfront protection portion of the bylaw, which is got to do with basic flood protection and stuff like that, people may not be able to get flood insurance through the federal program. That means if you want to get a mortgage, you may not be able to do that. If it doesn't pass as well regarding the RV section, it'll refer, revert to the existing section. I know there's a lot of concern. You've probably seen some of the stuff um, and heard it in a newspaper about the RVs on the river and issues about compliance with the fire code, the building code, the conservation and stuff like that. If this bylaw doesn't pass, it'll have no effect on that. The conservation building, fire code, etc. has always been in effect. It was just never enforced very well. It is now being enforced. So though, though that section of the bylaw, or the, that section of the uh, control by various boards in the town will not change. You still need to comply with conservation, fire code, health code, whatever it might be. The big, biggest section regarding RVs is currently the bylaw requires that a RV go for a special permit from the ZBA to put a RV on the riverfront property. This new revised section removes that special permit and the building inspector is now so called the enforcement officer of this riverfront bylaw and they will then comply with conservation building like I was been taught, just been mentioning the uh, multiple RVs are not allowed under the current bylaw they are allowed under the new bylaw based on certain criteria certain square footage per RV a certain separation between the RVs of so many feet etc etc so yeah it does make placing RVs on riverfront property a bit easier However, with all of the rules and regulations that the RV owners must comply with, that a property owners must comply with regarding conservation, fire code, etc., like I've been mentioning, making them jump through the extra hoop of the ZBA just didn't make sense. The ZBA doesn't want that responsibility, the planning board doesn't want that responsibility, and it really doesn't bring anything to the party. It just makes it one more step. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Paulette Costeva, 40 Knightley Road. Um, I just have a clarification question. I can't hear you, Paulette. Okay. I have a clarification question. Um, under 13.7.3.1, you're saying that they can, a recreational vehicle may be placed on any lot meeting the minimum lot size and setback requirements for dwellings in the underlying district. How does that affect many of the lots that are pre-existing and non-conforming? Mr. Dwyer. Uh, Bill Dwyer, 388 River Drive. Uh, if they're pre-existing, non-conforming, they satisfy the criteria. Thank you. Andy. Andy Morris, Friedman, 45 Roosevelt Street. I understand what this change in bylaw does for the zoning board and for the planning board. Uh, and I also understand what it does for the landowners and the people who have the RVs. But I don't understand what it does for the river. Does it prevent pollution? Does it stop erosion? Does it protect species? Does this have anything to do with protecting the river? Yes. It'll, again, the bylaw 
as currently, they need to comply with conservation. Will it prevent species, protect species? Well, I'm not sure about the species, but it will certainly, the intent is to protect the riverfront from erosion by addressing how many trees can be cut within a certain setback and stuff like that. So a lot of that will be addressed and regulated. Um, regarding the species, I mean, you know, you're, you're talking a bit different there as far as what's in the river, which should, should be helping to protect that stuff too, but it's not like I can put my finger on and say, it's going to do this. Paulette, can you speak as Conservation Commission to that question, please? So the Paulette Kasteba 40 Knightley Road, um, Chair of the Conservation Commission. The Rivers Protection Act requires the first 200 feet from the mean annual high water um, along the river to be protected or to be regulated. So the first 100 feet, the regulations require that that is the area that should remain pristine. If there are no other alternatives, then there has to be, you have to look at removal, then um, prevention, and then restoration or alternatives to it. And then the second 100 feet, from 100 to 200 feet, this is where any permits that are going to be before the Conservation Commission, the Commission has been asking people to move everything back out of that first 100 feet in order to meet the protection requirements that are in the Wetlands Protection Act under that section. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, hearing none. This, again, this requires two thirds. All those in favor? Pardon? Oh. You want to talk, Steve? No. Hang on, we're gonna. I'll, I'll let him talk. Nobody's spoken to this, so. Steve Zanke, 81 River Drive, Hadley. Uh, years ago, there used to be camping on Rainbow Beach. Uh, the state came in and says no more camping there because of the tiger beetle. Then there was Tent City down by Barstow's. State came in and says no more camping there. I was on a subcommittee to put the campers at another place, the state-owned land, but they didn't want to work with us for doing the camping. Now you got people that own their own property, they should be able to camp on it with more than one camper. And family and friends is mostly what I see there. And don't forget also that the campers are on a riverbank. They're still using all that land for farmland. So everybody wins, the farmers, the campers. I say vote yes. Okay, anybody else? Again, this requires two thirds. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, moving right along. Article 26, annual town election date. Finance Committee Select Board. A finance committee recommends 500, select board recommends 410. Move that the town amend section 68.3 of the town's general bylaws establishing the annual town election by changing the official date of the second Tuesday of April each year before annual town meeting to the third Tuesday in May of each year after town meeting. I have a motion. Motion and a second. Anybody have any questions or want to speak to this? You have to go to the microphone, Mr. Matusko. Shell Horowitz, 16 Barstow Lane. Um, I noticed the 4-1 split on the select board. I would just uh, love to have the elevator speech version of the arguments for or against. Go ahead, Jane. Up, down, who knows. Okay, the pros are it would save money. It costs between $3,500 and $5,000 a time that the town holds an election. So, for instance, we have passed some articles today that will require a town ballot. If the town election and those were held at the same time, it would save the cost of one of those votes. Um, it would also allow current elected officials to fulfill their term throughout the town meeting. And also, there would be a larger turnout. Fewer people turn out for special elections, but if you combine this with the town elections and 
override votes, if you will, more people will show up and therefore we'll have a better input from the town about what they want. The reasons against this, major one, it's a change. Second one, uh, if it goes into effect, the elected officials would have to serve an additional two months. And thirdly, it would be a later spring election, however absentee ballots would be available. Mr. Waskevitz. John Waskevitz, 160 E Street. Uh, I was the odd man out. If it's not broke, don't fix it. That's the way I voted. Thank you. Daniel. Dan did Kevitz, 130 Hockenham Road. Is this to change the day of the week of town meeting? To a Tuesday? No, it, it, okay. it's just changing the date of the election, not Very the good. town meeting. Anybody else? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Pass. Article 28 is about a parking ban. Select board of recommends this 500. Move that the town amend the code of the of the town by adding to section 420-18 winter parking ban provided that no parking is allowed at any time on any Hadley Street from December 1 to April 1 that shall include areas immediately adjacent to on-street parking which would otherwise impede snow removal operations or other emergency service functions and that the town clerk may make formatting changes as necessary to preserve consistency of the general bylaws. Do I have a motion? Motion and a second. Any questions? Mr. Matusko. Edwin Matusko, 116 Stockbridge Street. So does that mean the signs that I see on the streets now are not valid? That say winter parking ban are in effect? The signs are up now. That is correct. Uh, those signs have been there for who knows how long. And this past winter, when we went to put a couple winter, uh, there was a couple winter storms coming. We realized that we couldn't find in the actual town bylaws any record of a town meeting vote that passed that bylaw. So David Nixon looked back through paper records from decades ago. Everyone remembers passing it, and no one has a record of it passing. So uh, this will, I guess, make those signs legit. Dina. Dina Friedman, 16 Barstow Lane. My question is, I understand enforcing this when there's actually a snow emergency. If I don't have room in my driveway, I have people coming over and they're parking on my street on a beautiful day in March, am I gonna get ticketed? Chief Mason will respond to that. Thank you. Shell. Shell Horowitz, 16 Barster Lane. Uh, my question then would be, would it make sense to amend this to add some language about this being in effect for snow emergencies? It pretty, to me it says that, but I'll let somebody else speak. It, it said something about any day during that period of, of months. Uh, it didn't specify anything about weather. Yeah, it, the, the bottom line is, is that the way that the system works right now is, is Chris will have to declare a snow emergency. He has to reach out to the select board, and the select board has to declare the parking ban. That's problematic for a couple of different reasons. Number one, they don't know, they don't want to declare a parking ban if they don't have to, and it's always for snow removal purposes. And secondly, unless you're watching the town website all the time, <laughs> folks may miss that announcement that there is now a parking ban so this the reason i support this our article is because now the public knows that between those dates if it's snowing please don't park on the road otherwise the plow trucks are going to push your car a little bit further than yeah. where you stop my problem is that it doesn't say if it's snowing um that um i am concerned because you know we do have visitors coming and we 
Um, they do park on the street if there's no reason not to. Well, the, the, the enforcing authority on parking bans generally is the police department. The, the DPW could potentially call a tow truck if no one was available. The enforcement of this doesn't change. Uh, we don't just show up and tow cars. Officers will always be knocking on doors and trying to find people. So uh, Randy brought this up the other day, and in the last three days since Wednesday, I can't think of another reason why we would ever be looking for cars parked on the side of the road between December 1st and April 1st, okay. other than snow. Shell, the motion does include impeding snow removal operations, so I think it's insinuated that it's okay. relative to that. Thank you. Mr. Ward, would you like to speak? Uh, Rick Ward, 99 Mill Valley Road, Hadley. Of course, Hadley. Um, I'm a member of the church over here. Thank you for voting to fix the clock, by the way. Um, I'm wondering if we ever get back to normal, um, like when we have Christmas Eve service or something that happens and they're traditionally we have a lot of people, and they park along Mill Valley. No, they would park I mean, along not, Mill, not Valley. Mill Valley, right? Middle Street, excuse me. Long day. Heat exhaustion. <laughs> um, so that's a no-no, right? If it's snowing and you're blocking the plows, yeah. Yeah, okay. But I mean, say it wasn't snowing. Won't be a problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other questions regarding this? All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Okay, that's all the articles we have for today. Thank you so very much for coming out. Hold on, we're not done yet. I'm not gonna allow that. We gotta I gotta thank everybody first. So, again, like last year, it took a lot of effort to set this place up. So, select board, town administrator, finance committee, chiefs of fire and police, board of health, Jennifer Sanders James, Hadley Media, the DPW, the first responders, anybody else who had anything to do with setting this up and tearing it down. Thank you very much. Now I want to set the motion. Anybody in favor of adjourning or dissolving? We are not adjourning, we are dissolving. Any opposed? Go home. Thank you very much.